Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Talon Books Fall Book Launch. We are gathered here today on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam. I'm pleased to welcome our five fabulous authors being celebrated tonight, and I will start with Rahat Kurd. Rahat Kurd is a prose writer whose essays have appeared in The Walrus and Mizonev magazines. She is at work on a memoir about the making of Muslim culture in North America. The poetry sequence Seven Stones for Jamarat, published in Exile Literary Quarterly, is currently nominated for a Pushcart Prize and was a finalist in the 2014 Gwendolyn McEwen Poetry Prize. Rahat was selected as Emerging Artist in the Literary Arts category of the 2013 Vancouver Mayor's Arts Awards. Please welcome Rahat Kurd. So because my co-author, Sumaya Sayed, cannot be with us uh, for this event, uh, I decided to read a couple of sections from a poem that I wrote um, called Alcohol. And it's a long poem, and it was shortlisted uh, for the 2019 Malahat Review Long Poem Prize. Um, and I, I sent it to Sumaya in February of 2019. Alcohol, section two. The first man to dance with me after my marriage ended apologized again and again, having pulled me to my feet at a party for being drunk. In fact, I preferred his game, good-natured shambling his scruffy, scuffed boot shuffling, to the pestilence of rooftop summer small talk, the vacant chatter of the volleyball crowd. Really, he was gallant as Mr. Knightley, his limbs flailed towards some just out of reach memory of decorum, and I could give her the slip, that wallflower pinned to my shadow, that third wave feminist wondering how bored the DJ must be to resort to playing Sweet Child of Mine on 80s night. Could the world have kept this one thing intact for me? Since grade eight grad, the last time, don't tell my dad. I danced with a man I wasn't married to. Could the point be lightness? to twirl and filigree the air with every sign of forgetting, being free of it, being over it, free of it enough to lavish a few minutes proximity in a republic of strangers, no hard feelings, no harm done. I'd have liked to think he wanted to reach the place where he could see I already was. That his, I'm sorry I'm so wasted right now, was meant to concede the fact Alcohol had failed to take him there, but I'd gained no elevation higher than boredom-tinged resignation. Sure-footed sobriety had brought me only to this, awkwardly keeping time with morally conflicted stadium rock. My no worries, my sure, go sleep it off, perfunctory, perforce. My drunk nightly's outstretched hand no portent of transformation, but a full circling back to the darkened school gym where two boys squared off, pulling at my elbow at age 12, resentful as Western sieve and Islamic sieve, demanding I pick a side. Why do you make the poster if you weren't going to dance? If you weren't going to dance, then why do you make the poster? Alcohol Part 3. In Devdas, an extravagant carouse winds itself around a knell of mourning. Shook, SRK, grips Jackie Shroff by the shoulder. Madhuri rings the temple bell in echo of Udit Narayan's anguished tonal shift. It's she who's most stricken struck again with delight when Shroff beckons her to the contest of the Agile, 
her cool self-possessed, silk-swathed dancers against his cotton-clad phalanx of bumbling binge drinkers. Between tavern and temple, the dazzling call and response of onomatopoeias, the struck chalak chalak of the men's whiskey glasses, the rung chana chan of the women's silver anklets. What's the hook that keeps me watching? Could it be the only sexy thing ever suspended in the air between men and women? The promise to meet as equals? More dangerous than the bottle, Madhuri raises out of the men's reach, now playful temptation, now foreboding, as the dagger eluding Macbeth's grasp. Come, let me clutch thee. I wish I were quicker. I wish I'd been born to quickness, like Madhuri, like musicians who solve the problem of how to measure time, dancers who apply the science of how to take up space, how every thal inscribes a technology of keeping up with the body's innate sense. Here is what I was made for. Still, as Chandra Mukhi, she has no real power. Her vocation is always to guard the line of public morals. See the jasmine-haired women ring their anklets around its sharp edge. To make the work appear as weightless as the frown that flits across her brow. To disguise the emotional drudgery of holding down the gender divide as irresistibly danceable. See the men stagger all over it, smashing glass after glass for others to sweep away. And what rage can I summon? What divine force will witness how I live to write the words women and men? And no one argues. Everyone knows, despite centuries of public protest, private anguish, knowing how much of what makes us feel most alive escapes the drag of their nets. How the one still remains a persistent weight pressing down on the other. Only Devdas has the right to drive the plot, and he does recklessly, having condemned himself to drink until death. The alternative to fight to be with the woman he loves was already always way off the table. Rosiel Agen is a poet and writer. Her poems, chapbooks, and interviews have appeared both in print and online across Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom. She has taken part in writing residencies at several international art centers and is a recipient of a research and creation grant from the Canada Council for the Arts. A Future Perfect is Agen's first book of poems. Please welcome Raziel Agen. Good evening, bonsoir. Thank you for being here. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Kevin Williams and everyone at Talon Books, to Les Smith for beautiful cover design, to Nicole Razia Fong for her generative feedback during the early stages of editing, and of course to Katrina Strong and Charles Simard for their editorial insight and really for helping me to rethink the concept of the book, not just this book in particular, but rather the book in general, bookness. And of course, thank you to my family and friends and community of writers for supporting me over the years. And finally, but not least, thank you to all of you for being here virtually, for listening, because without listeners and readers of poetry, there simply are no poems. Gene Loss. Has it happened yet? Have you sprouted a feather, a tail, a fin, or a gill? 
as a leaf or a blade of grass pushed up between your antlers. Have the heavyweight wisteria and clematis vined their way around the trellis of your shoulder blades, wrapping around the corcoid processes, latching onto the phalanges of your wings. Are you in bloom? Have you started to decompose? Have you made that lateral shift into a tangled thicket, a mutated chimerical being of light and wonder? Are you enjoying your next life as a rabbit toad? Are you evolved? Have you permitted it to happen without resistance? Has the glee of recombination taken over? Is your incarnation underway? Have there been any glitches, complications? Are you stuck in a net meant for trout or clams? Has a trap been set? Are you okay? Are you beside yourself, suspended in disbelief that you are now also part fern? Do you need a guide for the perplexed, moss on your knees, as you furrow through this horizontal transference, renegotiating a shift in molecules, dropping off the Y, sliding sideways into the X axis of infinite possibility. You are free now. You must be so happy, finally to become the leopard heron you've always known yourself to be. You're co-evolving. It's your time. You can do it. You're a boy from Brooklyn and a single-celled organism of the sea, dreaming in an ocean bed. You are becoming more you. You are composting, decomposing, in transition, on your way back to becoming Earth, mineral enjoyed by worms. By now, your bones are probably reduced to dust, a pulp, a fine mist. I want to help you understand these new life forms, help you shovel your way towards realizing your infinite potential. Can't you see how great it is? You are asparagus and a star. Even though my gut feeling is still no, this is not okay. It's happening. Embrace the gene loss. I'm happy for you. Really, I am. No mother, no father, no origin. You are overlapping realities, cross-pollinating with everything. You are an arachnid hydrangea, a rattlesnake bee, a rainforest lamppost, malleable, fluid, in flux. You are cosmic intelligence. You are geology. You are changing, but the sun remains the same. You are becoming more you. You are now in process, giving off gases, an ozone unto yourself. You're the physics of a petal, the mathematics of rain, the sacred geometry of a trilobite encrusted in rock. You've gone primal, cut loose all ties, the knots and tassels of your remembrances clipped, committed to memory. You know all the prayers by heart. After you went Nova. Tiny pinpricks punched through a black backlit sheet of paper, a handcrafted galaxy, capitulated constellations, a milky way of want, starry, starry grasping at being as such. And what if everything we saw, everything we did, everything we said, everything we said we saw, everything we said we did, and did everything we said we would, were congruent, aligned. Folding even pleats in the night sky, we become mysterious 
to ourselves. Open, adaptable, origami. Vision of impossible proportion. We sharpen the folds, defining our creases with a filed whalebone that feels good to hold. We meet our edge, we close our eyes, we envision 1,000 of us taking flight, a wish to live more simply. Waking, we are greeted by the morning star. When it's over, I'll have moved to Marfa, Texas, in impenetrable aloneness, a plot of land, a tiny home, green beans and cherry tomatoes, corrugated, contained, bending the possibility of possibility. Seeing from the inside, together, we emerge in congruence, lighter somehow. Who knew this being as such would go on being after you went Nova? By obscure means, we alter each other. In a future perfect, we will have become who the other ought to have been. The door of this. Between here and somewhere lies a lopsided disjunctive bar, a setup for a supreme deviation from life and its sumptuous interface. An atmospheric clouding denotes a subliminal lingual domination burning the toads of cognitive dissonance in the face of death. Watering, wanting to grow the terrain, consubstantial visions, a story of water, plastic passions and sunken skulls in the shadow's light as an alternative. To repurpose our being here, a euphoric solitude with a palette for the infinite. Days, when voluntary delusion in an artificial paradise will have seemed just fine. Called, calling the innermost monitor, a reciprocal sense of self to the other spaces we inhabit. In the moments prior to a sheath, a layer, a shroud, never a wholesale merger, settles into irreconcilable sediment. At the bottom, it is always difference. At odds with what will have been or become submerged in a connective medium. Vibration partitioned by stretches of gauze, each abode also a node, the soul enters within itself in folds vacuoles, empty cells, porous spaces, sheer husks lined by translucent skins. Still, we catapult toward something. Encapsulated in catacombs, the sinew of dream voids held by an infinite net of night. And before I close with this last poem, again, thank you to everyone at Talon Books and to all of you for being here. Tree Line. Along the cliffs and crags, folds and faults, we gather our complicit parts, moving headlong into the rock face, edging ever closer to meaning. We scale the flank, lip, and shoulder of this dark passage at the brink of breath. Shouldering the howling, holy, 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 
holy, holy, holy, holy. We will have made it past the landslip and above the leafiest of tree lines. This lovely rarefied air makes it hard to breathe, but in it we are so alive. Cedared to the rafters, oaked to oblivion, spruced to the brim, branching ever skyward in an arborization of words. Thank you. Nicole Razia Fong is a poet living in Montreal. Her work seeks to delimit and reconstruct immaterial ampules of psychic experience focusing the incorporeal into inhabiting a more muscular physique. Please welcome Nicole Razia Fong. Dramatis personae, heroine, luminous, a star, maternal love, child, chorus, anti-chorus. Prologue delaying arrival into a seer judgment of forms. The performance here begins, of sockets reduced to iterative dimension, of a well-timed simple crash, suggesting hilarity or catastrophe, of a blemish transposed between acts upon a previously flawless exterior, or the morning whose evidence is concealed by a shroud, or the prayer whose veiling substantiates the backdrop to another simultaneity, only to be removed before the final scene, only to again return to the flawlessness of seeming, the perfection of the mask giving way to breath or affirmation, repetitive, inseparable from life, and so becoming the most evocative expression of living, or any expression of living, or any memory of living, or any dream of living you might have experienced in the past, are living in the past, unable to verify the probability of that which has already transpired, are feeling content and fulfilled in the concurrency of your continued life. Heroin and Luminous stage a performance of Plato's Theaetetus with Luminous as Socrates and Heroin as Theaetetus. Socrates. How many birds do you see there? Theaetetus, I am a boy whose willpower is mechanical. Socrates, to accept the accordance of change is to avoid refutation. Theaetetus, I am a girl whose monstrosity occurs on a gradient. Socrates, a pastoral throwaway between change and changelessness ignites a golden cord within the skeletal system. Theaetetus, in a garden on an incline. Socrates, a clear, uninhabited tone. Theaetetus, my skin consists of a hard, colorless wax struck through with gold. My skeletal system, soft red honeycomb. Socrates, disparity. Theaetetus, this concurrence within the same name. Socrates, how many birds do you see there? Theaetetus, an oceanic bird made of candle wax. Socrates, I have been refuted. An incremental eye, 
Back then, I wrote to illusion. Back then, truth was unveiled to be a shimmering garment sequined with ashes. Truth was unveiled to be an agent of distaste dressed immaculately in echo. This cloudy, perceptual fold encountered in the midst of illuminated night, remembered without naivety. Antichorus, amorously. A completion of who is chorus. I leave upon the so to face the of this so I might an interior marred. Chorus. Breeze ruins the, the image, the actress is acting. My inevitable mark, stage. Might a river, originary desert, in bulging extremity, woundedness, wake anew. Like the late leaves requiring, I wrote to you across a subjectless inquiry. The nature of inquiry was to establish any sensorium of cohesion by which an unbreakable line of experience might remain equally unquestioned. A breeze ruins the completion of the image. I leave my incomprehension upon the stage. So might a river deface the originary desert and bulging extremity of this woundedness, like the late noon requiring division of feature from form. I wake anew in the interior. Had the provocation of a moment allowed my entrance, I might have ushered you in behind. I might have asked, had a moment allowed. The world's priceless wreckage, wordless interiorities of resonance and replication, gardens of roses, gardens of intuition, gardens and gardens and gardens. A torn rose, worn in lieu of a shield. A torn rose, worn as a dress, worn in lieu of a shield. A dress is worn, worn in lieu of a shield. The roses remain beautiful in excess, though indiscreetly dyed. The floral disclosure of nearness conveying an irretrievable tension. Every surface is retinal. Rain is falling. At this moment, no longer. Luminous. In downpour. Heroin. I misplaced a mistaken assemblage. Child, a vanillic procedural garden. Heroin, a luminous grove. Luminous constructs an artifact. Heroin, I couldn't otherwise with such vehemence adore this cold silver curfew. Composure posturing itself in tedium cleaving the substance of its sustaining with wrath. Luminous poses the question. Heroin, what formality do I expect from the universe? Child, for the sun to maneuver between leaves? Enter maternal love. Failed requisite, this surpassing which recalls the world, this world, a requisite surpassing of itself. Antichorus, I am turning, the birds are, I don't know, course, in this sensation. Of all, I ended mine, it ended then in I, Will this course? I disappear, yet where anti course? We chorus where?
The birds are flying again in this way. Why do they? Away from this path, flying again in this way. When I became hearing them, way becoming aware of new and the sameness, other things. The war with resistance, me. Won't see you any longer, be. A maroon that wants time to, would I be without it? Desire to destroy, which can be destroyed, will I be? Antichorus. I received you, I received you, I received you beyond the terms of a possible storm, across the terms of any probable storm, I received. As this came to pass, and birds felt necessity in this way, the architectural emptiness of the dream paired its song with intentionality and surface, and it came to pass that I was to receive you upon the terms of an itinerant dream. Effortless Affront The starless weight of gain is a spiteful equanimity, as probability might cast its redirection in a manner supposing your relevance, so must fate necessitate more than an alteration of that which has already passed. An unforetold changing of the immutable, the pastoral, the already imbibed, the amnotic, the dreamed, occurs beyond each simultaneity. There can be no messenger. Antichorus. Flower, this what has brought to me, stroking the iterative torso, I came to affliction. I saw it, solidity, the you had mentored, clarity, long, allergic, distinct, sensory bodies, simply. Gratitude, morning, is you here, bleeding, of clarity, believe in, finally, in mind, with distinction, Unspooling symbols within the sun, simply. That unbirthed quality by which you appear, mention it. With acuity it appears, with gratitude. The quality of your appearing in assemblage negates true appearance. Of gratitude, nothing. I speak only of roses catering the edges between transformation, roses which have also occurred by another name, by whose unmoved quality also appears, unmentionable surface, unmentioned. A poet and literary scholar, Dale Martin Smith was born in Dallas, Texas. He earned a BA and PhD in English from the University of Texas and an MA in Poetics from New College of California. He is the author of the full-length poetry collections, Slow Poetry in America, Blackstone, and American Rambler. Smith's scholarly contributions include Poets Beyond the Barricade, Rhetoric, Citizenship, and Dissent after 1960, and two edited editions, An Open Map, The Correspondence of Robert Duncan and Charles Olson, and Imagining Persons, Robert Duncan's Lectures on Charles Olson, for which he received Simon Fraser University's Charles Olson Award. His essays and poetry have appeared in Poetry, The Walrus, LA Review of Books, Boston Review, and Lambda Literary. With Hua Nguyen, he edited Skanky Possum, a literary zine and book imprint from 1998 to 2004. Smith joined the Faculty of English at Ryerson University in Toronto in 2011. Please welcome Dale Martin Smith.
Um, I'm going to read from a section of poems in my book called In the Exchange. Before I do, I just want to thank Kirby for filming this and for uh, letting us invade his outdoor patio space. Um, it's been really terrific here and I'm really grateful to Talon for publishing this book. Um, it's a book that for me is about Toronto or about Canada and uh, the United States and the boundaries or the imagined boundaries between those two nations and a lot of the, the work in here is trying to think through those those relationships. This is in the exchange. Filled the hours of today with many obligations. Paused a moment with the trash, icy and tight, to see white snow and orange street glow. A car pulled up to the curb. The guy who collects recycling rummaged through cardboard for bottles and cans. My footprints from earlier had faded under a white expanse of new snow. Absolutely uneventful as language. The many traces of words lost, unvoiced in stillness. We are it, I guess, in the dark garbage calm of a week's remains. Mexican parrots are dim in my mind. The president of all the globe somewhere grows calm as a babe in a madness of who owns and doesn't. The man finds my empties, clanks a bag around to his car. Dear winter deities, let us go, believing in fragile exchange. Merchants covered the ocean, bloodied the St. Lawrence, the great lakes of the north. In manic disposition, their law imposes sanction. For once, it could just be quiet and dissension. I like the sound the snow makes under my feet. I listen to it squeak. I feel the inconstant slippage. The cold stings my arms. Another day and nothing in the full dark after dinner isolate remains. Um, and this is a this is a poem called "Everyday You." Uh, part of the, part of this book is also, I think, informed by by lyric, by music, by musicality, and folk folk songs. And some of the next poems I'm going to read sort of dip into that. "Everyday You." Every day you look for surprise in the ordinary routine of now. An awakening through the noise shows what's light and ready to be known, your own ongoing ground. And on you return like a musical pattern, on to the sound, on in the round of days to play in, as if a child wilded the lost and the found, the weird and the blatant beat. This is Everybody Ought to Treat a Stranger Right. Um, it's about uh, Willie Johnson, a great gospel singer from the 1930s who uh, lived in Beaumont, Texas. He recorded his, his great recordings in Dallas in the 1930s. Vision isn't seeing, and blinded, the voice tears through Beaumont, Dallas, 1930s, hot that sound, gospel tense, God laid out the road you're on, set on fire, you, Stranger, sit, sound a lyric thrumming, Willie Johnson. Barrel-chested testament expands the cracked heat vocal strange and appears not single nor personal. Pierce then the mask, one measures oneself, created. Adam's face the dark sees through, God don't never change. And this is one, um, uh, working through uh, Woody Guthrie, wreck on the old highway. Hang around, daddy. Woods and fence line guide the highway. He was born working down and out and robbed molasses or stole the colors and tore the feathers, ate pork fat, hominy, gravy, rattlers, green pastures cleared by Haitian traffic, a manse, chata trails, highways engulfed by flame and ransomed human dignity from machine code that refusal, hymnal, and song, the human bone cagey, seeing, and take privilege as mercy's cowed bulk, the meat and grain, they are eyes, what sees through, blank holes, ghost toys ache, invisible, outreaching. And um, this is, this poem called Shreve. Shreve is a, a character that informs this book 
Uh, Shreve is a, a Canadian in two William Faulkner novels uh, set in the Deep South. And I found it odd that there was a Canadian there and this figure out of Faulkner helped me think through this relationship of Canada and the United States. It's called Shreve. I used to walk with my son to his dojo. I'd sit there on a black vinyl sofa that smelled of other boys and men while he used his body on the mats with kids his age. I tried to read, looking up, looking down, my glasses moist in the humid gym. I wanted to figure something out about Canada and my being here from Texas. What were the differences? Where did nation intersect? Faulkner's Shreve got me thinking about past life in the southern USA and how the alien Canadian shield yielded such weird, rocky, yellow pine, organic, jagged density of place. And white European descended Protestant folks and Jewish people and Caribbean and Haudenosaunee and prairies, mountains, oceans, Arctic ice. There is no ground, no person, no thing. Shreve is character charisma invented by American looking. Shreve presses on in disbelief for more story in the exchange huddles next to his American friend, one cold Cambridge night, listening, West Indies ships signaling, harvest routines, common, mean, discover no bottom to desire. My son tugs my arm. Did you see me, he said. I won the spar, the other boy laughing next to his father, lowered my book, said hello to him. And I'm just gonna end with a poem called The Dream Electric. Shaking leaves and blossoms, Pickering and Darlington, just south, Lake Ontario, driving the 401, deciduous greenery, divided in machines of convenience and delicate uncertainties of material life. The highway is stalled with holiday traffic. In a time before me or you, a quiet like crickets or running water texture the everyday, as if time never began melting ice, species die off. In grain or meat, fleshy protein, we kill things or possess them, invent motors, fuel rods, cool or radioactive stew, like dreams of mythic creatures swimming open-eyed in emerald lumen to warm our nakedness. The romance of utopian dalliances and free soil transits destiny or just plain history. The plant steams electric. Carolinian woodland, home to warblers and red-winged blackbirds, predates the human idea. I've gambled in England and in Spain, lonesome, the cuckoo, little white churches, clean fields, the energy of things released by sunlight, the maiden, a virgin dynamo luxuriant. Google the World Fair 1900, Henry Adams, cathedral buttresses and synchrofoil cruciform transepts, abstract force of piston and steam. Believe rapid telepathy, shamanic handprints stained in limestone, the ancient chemical, the chimeric charm fueling up in Frontenac narrowing distances, wind and light and sky. Thank you very much. Ryan Fitzpatrick is the author of Coast Mountain Foot, Fortified Castles and Fake Math, and 15 chapbooks. With Jonathan Ball, he edited Why Poetry Sucks, an anthology of humorous experimental Canadian poetry. He has participated in the literary communities of Calgary, Vancouver, and Toronto. In Calgary, he was on the collective of Filling Station Magazine and was the organizer of the Flywheel Reading Series. In Vancouver, he earned his doctorate at Simon Fraser University, where he worked on contemporary Canadian poetry and space. In Toronto, he recently completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto Scarborough and was a co-organizer of the East Loft Salon Series with Rajinder Paul S. Paul and Nikki Sheppy. Please welcome Ryan Fitzpatrick. We're starting, Kirby? We're starting? Yeah. This is like, I'm doing this on purpose because like, I feel like this is the way you start a reading, right? Yep. Uh, rather than just like starting with, um, I don't know. I'm just going to read some poems from this book. Uh, Vancouver does not taste like Calgary. How to start writing about any city? Is it anything like living somewhere when you don't feel so welcome? A shitty question. When structures benefit you, though they never feel too beneficial. 
when rent is cheaper inside the couple form, or when work involves constantly bootstrapping, all the slack anxiety of comfortable precarity. What does that ad say across the street? Pocketed deep inside the doors at Hastings and Howe? Luxury never makes anyone beautiful. They're debating view cones at the edge of the upcoming civic election. Whether seeing the mountains is an amenity if the developers near the stadium keep their word about building 1,800 units of social housing, unlike the rug pull of Olympic Village, where they felt the sudden luxury of all that prime waterfront real estate unlocking like the tides through Sunak were gulped by Vancouver's swallowing growth. Managing Vancouver's postcard view is a hell of a tough question when you scoff at privileging sight lines, but also love that view down Maine, even if it raises property values. Some places you can only see mountains hitting the crest at Glenmore and Blackfoot. Is that good? Is that good? That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd uh, like to hear more. Yeah, I'm going to read some more. Okay. Uh, the economic case for tackling loneliness. What is the mode of writing best suited to mapping the social? I used to think about recombination, which is really the kind of appropriation where you turn the oil into cool with. How many cars have passed by in the last minute? How many stopped at the stop sign? How much gas burned idling in the cold? What's in their tape deck? iPhone, etc. Who was it spit against this window? How many days to wait until you complain about a shipment that hasn't arrived yet? That book I've been waiting for, how many hands has it passed through? That's a pretty silly question to ask about global logistics as they play intimately. When Laura sings, oh my dear, it's only love that keeps us here. I want so badly to believe it, but it's hard when the city form can't imagine life outside sex and work. Shit, in my most cynical moments, what is here if not structure on the move? What would Marx say about that? Something about capitalist totality holding us together. After all, emergence doesn't feel like much in the belly of development gone wild. But also, it's just hard to ask someone, hey, do you want to imagine new forms of social intimacy without it coming off as a pickup line? We're good? Yep, we're okay. good. We're good. Okay. All of our work is becoming more complex. Walking down West Georgia on the north side, across the street, TELUS's window celebrates pride by celebrating their expansive LTE network. Love is the greatest connection. A block down another slogan, courtesy of West Bank, across from the VPL central branch. Culture reflects society. Is this the best we can do? Our relations and affects only grist for the ongoing millwork of value generation? I turn the corner at Beatty, heading to Anahita's reading at 8 East, an art space in Chinatown, formerly Selectors Records. They've replaced the BC history mural with something by a group of indigenous artists, which is great. But what happens to this piece when the new VAG goes up in the mural adjacent parking lot? Will they build up around it like the King Edward Hotel in Calgary? Now the fabled blues venue only a cornerstone for the development of the East Village, folded into Studio Bell near the new library. How are we doing for time? I think we're going to do one more. One more? Uh, let me see which one I want to do. But let's just do this one. Let's, let's do this one. one. Let's do this one. <laughs> with, the, with the classic uh, John Denver title. Uh, it keeps changing fast. It doesn't last for long. Waiting for the 72 circle route, I chat with a local about the C-Train extension into Ogden and the expectation of condo development, like the pockets around the SkyTrain, the resistance against the viaduct in Strathcona, 
the way Calgary's roads meet Vancouver's buildings. On the 24, driving past the site of the Shamrock Hotel, recently demolished, though they saved the hotel sign, like the Lido in Kensington, the Cecil downtown, as if texture were a form of memory. All these ghosts of relations past, just steam pouring off the wastewater on the 24, heading north on Ogden Road, past the yeast smell of the distillery. It's all so 1970s, isn't it? Or 1990s, or 1950s, or whenever. Did you know about the residential school where the Calf Road Bridge is now? Just south of the Bonnie Brook plant on the north side of the Bow? That's where this article places it anyway. I found it in the VPL stacks downtown.